thank uh, ISM Montreal, uh, especially Maxim, to organize this uh, presentation. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, working with camera and use them as a sensor, and uh, we had some really uh, good success story, and would like to share uh, what we have accomplished over the, uh, I would say, since the pandemic started, we had uh, the chance to focus on other uh, uh, challenges. So um, just before we introduce ourselves, uh, just a, a short uh, safety share. Uh, you know, I find that out. I found interesting to take talk about camera, and, and uh, I found that uh, you know, can you point a security camera at your neighbor? Uh, you know, the bottom line is yes, but uh, you should not be. Uh, uh, watching inside the uh, the home of uh, your neighbor so something to remember i don't know if you you could be catch but uh, that's uh, some information i found on the uh, on the, one of the uh, government uh, website so the presentation will be done by myself serge benoit uh, and uh, uh, i've been i joined bba uh, like 26 years ago and I was working for Kimberly Clark before. Uh, this is where I got my vision background with Kimberly Clark, uh, high speed vision system. But uh, with the help of uh, Harbi, we've introduced the uh, machine learning, the AI side of it. So uh, Harbi will be presenting uh, in more detail uh, how we uh, do the uh, convert the image into a sensor. Thank you, Serge. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Arbi. Uh, I'm a data scientist, um, uh, industrial IT team leader at BBA. Uh, I have joined BBA two years ago. Uh, my background is related to data analysis, artificial intelligence, and uh, the related fields, so statistics, data engineering, programming. And uh, I'm usually looking for building concrete application of AI and advanced analytics. So today, Kamas is a good example of how we can apply uh, image analysis and AI. So the agenda today will cover, you know, how it started, the background, uh, the context, uh, how do we do the integration, multiple application, and at the end, uh, open discussion and uh, a frequent ask question that we get from uh, our client. Uh, so uh, in 2018, uh, I work in uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, one of the challenge was uh, to re remotely operate uh, the, the gold mine. Uh, you know, the qualification of personnel was really uh, low, I would say. Uh, so we we were successful to uh, implement a, a remote center uh, for the HMI SCADA site, but for the camera, we had a quite a big a challenge because we only had seven megabytes of uh, bandwidth. So this is how the ID came from a uh, let's uh, take the camera feed and, uh, you know, convert it into a, a signal uh, or an alarm or a set point, whatever uh, the, the challenge or the, the camera was aiming to. Um, uh, so in the year after I was working on a lithium plant and it was pretty much the same thing, uh, you know, in, uh, in Argentina, in the Andes at uh, 400 meters uh, in elevation. So not a lot of people wanted to work over there. And we also had a bit more megabyte. We had, we had 10 megabytes, but it wasn't enough to uh, to get, you know, send the video feed uh, at the remote uh, center. So that, that was two interesting projects that uh, lead us to uh, do a better usage of uh, the camera. So uh, just a context with traditional video wall, it's impossible to monitor all cameras at the same time. Uh, quite often it's difficult to link the image uh, or the uh, that was recorded with the SCADA historian. Uh, uh, they're not always match in times and it's difficult to uh, to uh, try to identify the cause of a problem at downtime. Uh, the quantity of images sometimes is, uh, is so big that it's hard to go back uh, and find those images. And sometimes the people, the, the company don't just have large quantity of uh, storage. 
uh, in some cases they only had uh, like a, a day in other cases uh, seven days and uh, so it's hard to go back so with camera as a sensor it's a 24 real-time monitoring uh, data can be sent to SCADA historian can be used for intel locking uh, and when we do remote support uh, when an event occur or a, a change uh, we uh, just send a snapshot of the image just to confirm uh, the, the, the result if it's in line with the, the expectation. So uh, we'll let RB talk about how we implement or uh, we do the uh, video analysis. Thank you, Serge. Um, yeah, so um, there are a lot of possible application of CAMAS in different domains. Uh, such as mining, hydro, uh, safety. Uh, what you see on the left side of the screen are some typical applications like uh, PSD, particle size distribution, uh, dust monitoring, public safety. Uh, but you will see later in the presentation, uh, Serge will show you a few applications of CAMAS that we had successfully deployed, especially in the mining domain. So um, now I will describe, um, I would say I would, uh, at a high level, the steps we follow when we build a new uh, CAMAS application. Um, it all starts from video stream that we get. First, we cut the video into different images. Uh, we call that frames. Uh, it could be uh, every second, every half second, every five seconds. Uh, the frame size really depends on the application we want to build. And once we get those images, we pre-process and prepare them to make them ready for the analysis. So um, when we do the image pre preparation, we remove noise. Uh, for example, we keep only the parts that are relevant to our analysis and we transform the, the image into a grayscale to change the intensity and we resize it, etc. Um, just a few slides later, I will show you an example uh, of image processing we do for, uh, for one of the application. Um, after that, uh, we look at the image we have in the um, in the data. So if the data is annotated or not. Uh, basically, annotated image means that we have the image and its label that we want to predict. For example, uh, if we want to detect an anomaly, which is an abnormal situation, annotated data could be a set of image with a label saying whether the image corresponds or not to a normal situation. So if we have only the image without their label, in that case, we don't have annotated data. Uh, so in case... Hey, do you want yes. to, to switch to the second slide? Or uh, sorry? Sorry. Do you no, want no, me no. To... no? Okay. I will let you know. I will take some time to explain this because this gives a good idea of uh, how we deal with that. So um, in case the data we have are annotated, we use machine learning approach to build the application. In the other case, if we don't have annotated data, we go for computer vision to do it. Uh, so in the first case, uh, the, the yellow part, uh, we select the model to be used. We split the data into train and test. Generally, we choose 80% for training and 20% for testing, and we do the training into multiple iteration. Uh, we can also add a validation set to tune the hyperparameter of our model. So finally, um, once the training is done, we test the model on the new data set. So generally, those are the data that the model has never seen in the past. And depending on the accuracy of the model we get, we can decide either to stop the process or repeat it again and again till we get a good enough performance of our model. Um, I would say also the, the, the choice of the model depends on the size of the data, the quality of the Im image we have, uh, the type of the application we want to build, and also the target KPI that we want to reach. Uh, in practice, we have a lot of options. We have neural network, decision tree, naive base, random forest, so a lot of options that we can use. Uh, so this is the first way we do it with machine learning. On the other way, if we don't have annotated da data, we go for computer vision. Uh, the idea is simply to use existing techniques of image analysis. Uh, so we want to analyze the image uh, through looking to the pixel color code distribution, and then we use that in other uh, in um, in other uh, uh, steps to discover some patterns that we will use to make the final decision. Uh, yeah, so finally, whether we use machine learning or computer vision, in both two cases, it's really important to enhance the noise and robustness of the model by testing it in different real situations. Uh, so for example, we ask ourselves how the model will behave when the image quality is low, when it's raining, when snowing, when, for example, uh, uh, it's the day versus night. So 
uh, it's important to make sure that the model is working in different real situation to make sure that we can deploy it in practice. And uh, yeah, and once we do that, of course, the last steps is to deploy the model and connect it to the data historian uh, and integrate the application to the process control system. Um, before uh, before we go to the next slide, um, I want to mention that sometimes when possible, we want to benefit from some process data set, such as the tonnage and level, level density to improve and confirm our analysis. So besides the image analysis, it's good if we can have extra data that we can uh, confirm the analysis with. And uh, most of the, 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 the development process that you see here are done offline and only the real time prediction is done uh, online. So by the end of the day, what we want to reach with that uh, is to make sure that we will be able to send an alert to the SCADA system in case an abnormal situation happen so that we can notify the operator in the control center and the operator will make the right decision. Uh, next slide, Serge, please. Yeah, so um, this slide is uh, it's just a quick summary of the machine learning approach that we can consider when building our model. Uh, basically, uh, we have three options. The first one is supervised learning. The second one is semi-supervised learning. And the third one is unsupervised learning. Um, we make the decision to take one or the other depending on the data we have. So for example, if we have annotated data, we usually go with supervised learning. If we don't have any annotated data, we should go with unsupervised learning. and <clears throat> If we have only a few annotated data, we can go with what we call semi-supervised learning. Um, for the supervised learning, we usually provide a set of images to our model that show the two situation, normal versus abnormal, and the model will be able to learn from the, the data, the differences between the situation. Uh, here, the good thing uh, that is the um, uh, if we have good enough, uh, good enough quality data, the model will be able to converge very fast. But the problem is that um, if the model didn't see in the past some specific situation, so probably it will be classified on the wrong category. So here you should make sure that the data you use for training cover the different situation. Uh, for the case of non-supervised learning, uh, the good thing is that we don't need any labeled data, so it's not costly, but because of the model didn't see what is an abnormal situation looks like, it will tend to classify it uh, anything in you as an abnormal situation. So everything that is different from what is seen in the past will be abnormal, which is not usually the case. So for this kind of model, when you will deploy it in practice, you will expect to see a lot of false positive during the first weeks. And finally, for the semi-supervised learning, uh, the advantage that we can highlight, uh, that we can highlight, uh, I will go with a simple example um, to, that describes how we do it exactly. Uh, I would say overall we have four steps. The first one is image acquisition. The second one is image pre-processing. Then we do image analysis to find the uh, patterns. And the final step is to um, uh, real time uh, uh, is to convert the image in real time uh, is to convert the real time image into a value. So suppose, for example, that we want to detect the presence or not of a track. Uh, so if a track is here, we want to return one. If it's not here, the model will return zero. Um, once we get a new image, we will pre-process it first. So we convert it into grayscale, blur, uh, blur uh, any other combination of color. And this transformation is important because it will help us to control the intensity of the image. Uh, after that, we uh, define what we call the focus zone, which means that we don't need to work on the full image and we just keep the part that is relevant for our task. So here, for example, um, for this case, we decide to keep a small part of the image to detect the track. So all the other parts of the image will be simply ignored. And to do that, we apply what we call a mask to so the black part that you see on the screen. And this part will hide the rest of the image. So this is for the pre-processing. Uh, the next stage is to um, to do the image analysis. So for this example, we display the distribution of the pixel uh, pixel color code and compare the two situations. Um, if you look at the, the 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 first distribution on the top, so this is an example that corresponds to an image with a track, and the other distribution on the on the bottom corresponds to an image without a track. So if you compare the two distribution quickly, um, you can see that the difference, uh, that there is a difference in terms of um, distribution for the color 150 and more. So 
as a machine, you can simply make the distinction between whether there is a track or not just by looking to the distribution. So by plotting this kind of um, of curve, the algorithm will be able to predict to predict predict a score one or zero so uh, for ever the track is here or not. And this is exactly the kind of pattern that we want to discover when we analyze our image and we rely on that to make the, the decision. And the last step, once we have the, the right prediction, we just call the model for real time image classification. Um, just to conclude this part, uh, here I don't show it, but as I mentioned before, it's really important to assess the robustness of the model by testing it in different situations uh, to see how the model will behave. So for example, for the, the, the track uh, detection, we want to see how the model, uh, does the model keep be working if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's dark, uh, if, uh, uh, if the brightness level is too high. So those are real situations that can happen and we want to make sure that the model is still working uh, with this new situation. Yeah, that's for my part. So I let you search continue for the next of, uh, presentation. The, you know, the way it all started, it's uh, we we connect to the existing uh, system, to the existing camera in the plant, uh, the uh, existing network or DVR digital video recording system. Uh, so all you, what you see in red is what we need to establish in terms of connection to uh, implement such a solution. You know, some people would think it would be in the cloud, but it's not the case. It's uh, we, you know, some of the, the cameras, the sensor application are uh, real time uh, machine critical. So it needs to reside on the uh, on the client infrastructure. So we need to establish link to the historian, the SCADA, the control system. Uh, we do connect either on the directly on the camera or through the the DVR, depending on the, the application or the bandwidth uh, that we have. So this is a, a, a typical uh, implementation. So what we need from the client is to, you know, provide the virtual machine, a remote access, uh, enabling the, the connection to all those systems. And uh, if we do have a historian or PLC, we need to have the client building those uh, uh, interface or point, whatever. Can you switch, uh, Ali? So the, the way we deliver, we, we use uh, the container approach. Uh, so the infrastructure can be uh, a server, a PC, an appliance, whatever. The, uh, the OS could be Windows or Linux. Uh, container engine, uh, it can be Docker, for example. But the, uh, the overall uh, way we manage a container, uh, we, we use a uh, foghorn. Uh, so, um, it's a uh, multiple uh, play, you know people from BBA that are uh, involved in this because we need to integrate to multiple systems. So in the case of R RB, it will be developing the uh, video and machine learning uh, model. And uh, if we need to connect to a specific interface, we do have other integrators that will uh, uh, build the interface or use what is already available in the uh, the platform that we use. So it's um, it it's uh, you know with all the, the the skills that we have here, we were able to connect to pretty much anything uh, so far. So can you switch? So I'll be you know so uh, so we have multiple uh, real time uh, well not real time but video that we recorded. Uh, so this is a, a plug shoot application in a mine. Uh, usually, you know, there is a, a switch or a level sensor in the chute itself, but uh, in some cases there is a big uh, rock or uh, um, something that will just bridge a chute and it's impossible for the sensor to uh, detect that. So uh, we do when it's uh, the, the, the coverage is, uh, is over a certain level, then uh, we'll send an alarm or an interlock to the PLC to shut down the, the conveyor. So it will reduce the downtime uh, to remove all the excess uh, of rocks in that case. So can you switch to the next slide? So this is the the the, the kiln uh, discharge end. It, the, the the material goes on like on a grade, and uh, the operation has to clean up that every four hours. But uh, with the students and other people uh, being uh, 
doing other jobs, they sometimes forget to clean that up and it falls on the floor. So the this real time monitoring uh, was done using an existing camera and uh, to uh, to sh shut down the, uh, the the kiln when this happened, because if it falls on the floor, you know, everything will uh, just uh, burn. Next one. Uh, in this case, we monitor the uh, uh, a ball mill uh, discharge uh, overflow. Um, and when we do detect too many material falling on the floor, we send a signal back to uh, the the ag mill that is uh, just before the ball mill to reduce the load in order to uh, minimize any rework, any uh, material falling on the floor. Uh, currently was done manually by operation, but this was uh, implemented uh, in a in the control loop. Next slide. Uh, particle size distribution. So using again an existing camera, uh, we are uh, able, I, I don't remember at how many frames per second uh, we uh, we scan the, the conveyor, but uh, we do give a real time uh, particle size distribution. And what that, what we do with this is we can monitor the, the crusher performance and uh, in the future we, we're uh, looking at controlling the opening automatically based on the uh, the rock uh, distribution. Next one. Oh, this is uh, explosion dust uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, this is a uh, powder sugar when uh, the rework or the, the when the loader is working too fast, it just creates dust and it can uh, becomes in really explosive and uh, the regulation uh, in Quebec uh, uh, required the, the the company to report any uh, incident or not incident but cases where explosive uh, condition were there and uh, so with the camera uh, looking at the uh, analysis we can provide a real time uh, you know monitoring activate the warning lights to uh, ask the operation to uh, let the, the dust go down and uh, maybe work uh, differently. Next slide, 3D level uh, scanner. So uh, we do have you know, two different, uh, you know, we have a picture it's a fixed one. Uh, so we on the left, so we use uh, the, the, the existing camera again, but uh, this one, uh, what is really interesting, it's a PTZ camera, so we can rotate the camera and uh, give a, a pattern on a 3D uh, dimension. On the right, it's a simple uh, storage that we monitor uh, and give uh, the, the level in the, the, the grid that we have uh, come up with. Uh, we, we're not seeing it here, but uh, we could use uh, two cameras to get the uh, you know, stereo vision and uh, or stereoscopy to you know improve the level sensing and uh, switch from quali qualification to quantification uh, that's another application next one uh, Arby. so we do have other uh, typical you know hydro application monitor uh, you know if there's a flood uh, coming uh, in a small um, uh, run off the river uh, hydro stations. Uh, we do monitor the, the flashboards. You know, flashboards are piece of wood that they uh, put on the top of the dam to get a large, larger quantity of uh, water in the reservoir. And uh, we're able also to uh, when um, to monitor the flow or evaluate the flow because some of those dams or uh, hydro stations are co controlled by flow, not by uh, kilowatts or megawatt. And we can also detect people because in some cases we need to release water and uh, we need to ensure that there's no one there uh, when we release a large quantity of water. So next slide. So this is a, a complete application where we, you see the truck with an, uh, uh, not an X, but a, a bar. So we do detect there's a truck, we do, Measure uh, each for each scoop the the, the particle size di distribution, and when the truck is loaded, we uh, come up with a, a final result saying, okay, uh, um, first truck uh, 
PSD1 that you see on the screen. Uh, this is how the, the, the screen size were at uh, the rock size were distributed. And uh, having knowing this, uh, we can decide if we need to do some blending uh, uh, before we ship it to the crusher or the plant. Uh, we can uh, inform the truck where to dump the material or, you know, directly in the crusher or in the, in the pie to do some blending. So um, this is, I would say, a, a total integration of uh, what we can do using the uh, the platform, the Fogon and the platform where we do see uh, those. And uh, so um, I, I need to thank uh, uh, Bosch for uh, uh, letting us, uh, letting use their camera for almost a year. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, to see all the benefit that we can get from those camera because some of the uh, so pre-processing is done directly in the camera. Uh, so uh, I want to thank uh, you know Bosch uh, for uh, letting uh, us play with those camera. So next slide. So th this is the frequent asked question that we get. Uh, those are you know interesting. So. How does CAMAS work when the PTZ camera has been repositioned by someone? Uh, the way we interface with the uh, camera system is not, it's bi bi-directional. So uh, when we use a PTZ, we know the position that we need to have the camera aiming. And uh, we, if it's not at the right position, we can send command and reposition the camera where it was. Uh, we can even display uh, a message on the screen saying, uh, OK, CAMAS is in operation. So uh, and we can decide, we, do we want to put back the camera where it was or leave it, you know, where CAMAS is uh, best, you know, location. So this is a nice feature. Why not use the AI embedded into a camera or a DVR at all time? Um, the, uh, the, the camera and DVR system are really great of implementing AI model that are for safety purposes. For example, uh, one of the uh, picture for Hydro, we uh, do the identification of people. This is built in and it works really great. But when it comes to more process uh, detection or analysis, uh, their model are not developed for those application yet. So that's why we we do the, the modeling or the analysis, the, the algorithm that the RB was uh, describing. So do we need to use an expensive or speci speci specialized camera? All the application that you saw, uh, you know, we were just using existing camera with without any lighting improvement. So uh, in fact, you know, if a human can see and take a decision based on what he sees on the camera or the video, uh, we can do it with CAMAS uh, without any problem. Do we need an IN server to host CAMAS? Uh, no, uh, you know, especially when we do deliver the application under Linux, uh, the, the, the CPU or the resources are really, really low, so we simply need a, you know, a small VM and uh, it's ready to go. So what is the typical lead time to implement CAMAS? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, built-in solutions that are applicable for, you know, uh, ready to be applicable. And, and in those cases, it's, you know, we're talking about days. When it's more complex, like, um, Using the uh, machine learning, it depends. Uh, you know, for example, detecting uh, uh, foreign material that we don't have enough pictures, the weight, uh, their position, this can take uh, weeks. It, it depends on the application. So, how much network bandwidth is required? Uh, most of the time, we do connect to the NVR, so we're not using more bandwidth on. Uh, but in some cases, we might have to read or to connect directly to the camera, and uh, because the way the the DVR is working and recording the images uh, is not, you know, we might not have enough frames. Or so uh, in some cases, yes, we need to connect to the camera, but for the most, we don't. So we don't uh, 
uh, have an impact on the on the network. So that was pretty much uh, all the uh, what we wanted to uh, uh, present today. Uh, so is there any? Uh, it's time for a for a question. So if you have any questions, and uh, we're ready to answer. And and I hope you've uh, appreciated the presentation. Hey, the the only question, and and I apologize, I had to multitask a little bit here. Is this this is a hosted solution, right? Is is there an on-prem option? It it is. Uh, get, go back, uh, RB, to. Uh, it is okay. Yeah, but uh, we'll show you the slide. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's being in, installed on the. Uh, let's say, uh, in most cases, it, it will be installed on the same server as the the DVR server. Okay. So, because in some cases it's a uh, you know real time, it's machine critical. It has to be, you know, at the client site on premise. Right. But if someone has a, uh, you know, really something that uh, he doesn't have the infrastructure, yes, it could be, uh, you know, all implemented in the cloud. Okay. So more questions? Oh, could you have multiple detection? Uh, I, it, it went fast. There's a question in the chat, I believe. Okay. Uh, could you have multiple detection zone with one camera? Could I monitor shipping dock utilization? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, we have a live demo running in the office. Um, RB, would you have access to show it real time? Uh, 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 not sure. Uh, yeah. So in fact, what we do at the same time, we do the uh, practical size distribution as well as the 3D level uh, at the same time. So we, we um, if you go back, uh, RB, to uh, the first slide that you've presented, you know, we, we do the pre-processing and in parallel, the uh, images goes wherever we want to for uh, whatever requirements we have. Uh, how many days do you need implementation for ball mail, for instance? Uh, a, a few days, you know, the challenge here is uh, where the camera, if there is no camera, it's easy. We just, you know, specify where it needs to be and we, uh, we uh, get the, the proper lightning in some cases, like the, the Bosch camera, they do have, there's an option to have two uh, lights, one invisible, one in infrared, and we can improve the, the, the image quality. So uh, in, in this case, it's uh, really, really, uh, you know, let, let's say the, the first, uh, the, the, the CAMAS, oh, good, great. So, let, let's say the uh, the virtual machine is there. The uh, all the uh, the access are configured. We're talking about hours, not days. How was this accepted culturally at your customer? Did it take a long time for operation to trust? Uh, that's a good question. Eh? Uh, we didn't had that one before. Um, so the the one question we had was, hey, people will be thinking that we're watching them, but you know, when the camera was first installed or it's there for a long time, this is not an issue. Uh, take, having confidence in it. For example, uh, if you go back, uh, RB, to the presentation for the PSD, the, the PSD, I don't know if, uh, you know the uh, the the product that it's called a whip frag. You know uh, it's fairly expensive, and uh, at that particular plant, they do have the the whip frag running, but it's uh, ten years old. The server is no longer working, and um, before it uh, they they shut it down. We compare our uh, application with the uh, the whip frag solution that is the range of uh, I don't know sixty thousand to hundred thousand dollars. 
and uh, we uh, our solution showed that we matched the existing result. Uh, so the in this case, yes, they took confidence. Uh, uh, for the dust, uh, explosive dust, that this was, uh, you know, really a good, uh, I would say, acceptance of this uh, solution. Uh, can you use CAMAS with PSC? Uh, I'm not sure about the question, but we can interface with the P with any brand of PLC, whether it's Allen Bradley, Modicon, uh, Siemens, CAMAS uh, uh, has pretty much all the interfaces uh, ready to uh, connect to any system. So I don't know if it's the question, but it, it cannot run on the PLC unless it's a soft PLC, and we could maybe uh, see if it could be implemented. So Steve, you have a question? Yes, I do, Serge. Uh, we've seen uh, from the crowd that we had some uh, uh, possible application for CAMA. So one question was for 24-7 uh, monitoring of shipping docks. So uh, I'm just wanted to ask if is there any other uh, possible application that were not asked from the crowd, see if CAMAS is capable of doing so. So it, it's been mainly presented as a mining and metal solution, but uh, I'm pretty sure it, it can be applied in other uh, uh, industries. So is there any other uh, possible application that you were uh, wondering if it's possible? Oh, like uh, with Agroper, mm -hmm. milk industry, they want to monitor uh, it because all the packaging is done uh, Downstairs, there is no one there, so they want to monitor uh, the, the spills and other condition that uh, I don't know how the details, but this is uh, we're just, you know, waiting for a video recording to uh, provide us a feedback on the feasibility, but. Uh, so, so simply put, as you said, if you can see it, you can track it through CAMAS, right? Yes. Uh, all right. And uh, like um, we need to watch uh, for, uh, I'm just working on this as uh, yesterday. It's, uh, they need to monitor the uh, the way the, the, the spray water. Uh, yeah. So that one, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an exterior application. Uh, the lightning uh, is, uh, you know, when the sun falls, it's uh, really tricky. So uh, we do have some challenge when it's outside. Another question for you, Serge. Let's say you are at the very early stages of uh, discussing with a potential customer. How do you start with using CAMAS, a proof of concept to see if your solution is able to detect at a customer location? So well, what, what is your first input to start something? If we do not have any camera, uh, mm -hmm. or if there's no camera, we just ask the client to walk down, take his phone, uh, take a fairly, I would say, good uh, picture or video, and uh, we give it to uh, Arby. And uh, you know, quite often, uh, one or two hours, we know uh, right away uh, it's, if, if it's feasible and the level of uh, robustness. Okay, so if I were to uh, use an iPhone, film something in my industrial process, can you manage to trigger something that's pretty much what you need as a first input, right? So we have a question from Ranitian. Um, so we would need, uh, I don't know if it's there, Guillaume Boilly to answer this question. Uh, uh, it, you know, the platform Fogarn that we use as a built-in uh, AI platform. So uh, what's under the hood, I don't know, but uh, you know, what what you see currently running, you know, we have multiple containers. One con container is uh, doing the three D uh, thing. One container doing the uh, pre processing, and uh, and one of them is the AI. But uh, I can just I cannot provide more detail. But it's a uh, it's part of the platform that that we're using. Uh, what's under the hood? I don't know. Yeah, basically I can uh, add some details. Basically, there is some 
inbuilt algorithm that we can directly use uh, as it is. Uh, this is generally for the application, uh, I would say that are standard application, for example, for object detection or for simple classification. But sometimes we have some customized applications. So in that case, we need to develop our own scripts. And um, Foghorn is flexible enough to let us deploy our Python script and test it directly on the platform. So I would say, it depends really on the application we want to develop. We can either use what exists or we can develop our own code that we can also deploy in Foghor. Does it answer your question? OK. So Maxim, as the ISA uh, president of Montreal, do you have a word to say? Yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation. I, of course, I'm familiar with your uh, your product, but there's was a few a few new application that I, I, I haven't seen, so I'm uh, I'm happy with the result, and uh, ISM Montreal was really happy to uh, to have you presenting this uh, this presentation. So, good job. Thanks, Maxim. So, if there is no more question, I think uh, we can uh, you know, thank you for uh, attending the presentation. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can contact us. In fact, uh, Maxim is supposed to just send an email with the. Uh, our uh, coordinates. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll send a, a little thank you note, and you'll have the um, a few information and all the, the the contact info from the the presenters, uh, RB and, and and Serge. So uh, feel free to reach out to them if you have any other question about this, or if you want just want to discuss with them, they'll be happy to take your call. Yep. Thank you, everyone, and if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact us. <laughs>